I have my, right. we are my, now orange, recording. my orange juice crayons mug. It's very important. <clears throat> okay, Giles, you're first up. You are. Hot off the gates. Sorry, I was trying to find the unmute button. Um, yeah, I, this may actually be being sort of, uh, what's the word, um, superseded by some of the stuff I was looking at the recent, um, some of the recent changes. I mean, so fundamentally, um, yeah, where it kept, what it came down to was I tried to, well, I've implemented now a source, um, a so, well, basically it's a, a load balancing filter that does a kind of an API lookup. Um, but obviously to do that, I had to um, change it so that the load balancer only got triggered um, on the first packet of every flow, because um, otherwise you'd be calling the API consistent, you know, repeatedly. Um, but it seems like you've now, there is now some sort of caching, some object caching stuff in there. Um, I was looking at that latest PR. Um, Mark, I think he'd sent me a link to it. I can't remember the number off the top of my head. Um, was that the one that Afinia did with the TTL timeout stuff? Yes, that was it. That was Just it. got merged. Oh, yeah. uh, that's cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I hadn't even got around to putting a timeout in mine. Um, so it's kind of neat that that's got all that in there. Um, yeah, and what I because because what I'd ended up doing, um, as I say, was was changing things so that um, you only basically you only did look up the first packet in the flow, and because there was a lack of um, obviously. You know, in terms of there isn't any kind of global variable or anything, so I, I was using metadata to do that, basically to to spot the new flow, and then to feed through that there was an existing flow from the catch. Um, and what I'd done was I'd I'd changed, I made it so that we basically instead of spraying packets round robin across the threads, I was hashing across them so that so that I didn't have to worry about memory contention between the um, between the flow cat you know with the flow cache and multiple threads. I'm guessing the TTL thing solves that, does it? Uh, you know, the issue of multiple workers accessing the same cache. Um, yes. Yeah, so we, I guess, like all all threads that we use to process packets, will access the same cache, or because they share the same filter chain, basically. Um, yeah. But we we do we, we do use a lot um, a bit of like read write lock in there. So there's it's not like everyone in each other's way, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was sort of too lazy to do that, but also um, I guess I felt like you actually pro possibly get better performance if you don't do that. If you have a separate, you know, if you if you can hash across available threads and then have a flow cache per thread, you'll probably actually get better performance because you'll have better memory locality. And avoid any delays due to locking, which then I guess made me start thinking because um, you already have kind of a session concept in Quilkin, don't you? But that's more for the returned packets. So I guess that's where I was wondering if we almost, if, if almost you sort, it will make sense to bring the two together and have kind of a session concept that's bi-directional, and then pin session effectively pin sessions to individual cores or threads, um, so that you you maximize the kind of locality of the memory um, as you're doing that. Um, I don't know, yeah, in terms of performance, I'm not sure how, you know, what the implications of that are. And, and equally, I suppose you don't want to, you know, premise your optimization is the root of all evil and all that. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and I guess really for, in terms of discussion, I was trying to figure out where things are going with all of that, whether that's the sort of longer term goal to have a kind of a structure where you know you only trigger things like the load balancer once per flow, um, rather than on every packet. Um, and I know there've been some discussion on that, um, etc. I think I remember that at some point we had the load balancer outside the filter chain. If I'm not misremembering, and for some reason we decided we only wanted to do like filters, maybe. Possibly not, um, but yeah, I like guess, way, way back in the day. Yeah, <laughs> and we're all like, that was a bad idea. <laughs> uh, I guess like the interesting part would be like how to figure out what a session is because to to get like a session, you need a source and a destination, and yeah. to get the destination, you sort of need to know something about the packet, and mm -hmm. 
unless we use some sort of filter or user, or unless we have some way to run some user code, it will be hard to get through that part before we can hash to any thread. I guess that's that's where right, and we'll we'll need to do something if we want to go that route. Yeah, I mean, all I'd done was just basically a hash to to assign um, packets to the worker thread, and then within the worker thread, I guess I was just running a cache that was per per source uh, source IP and port, because obviously destination wise on that side of the proxy, the dest IP and port's always the same, um, and then. When it was a new flow, I was running the load balance, um, and once I'd assigned an endpoint, I then effectively remembered that in the cache. And presumably, you could use your TTL thing for that, because it's only a, obviously if you if you time something out, um, if anything, you know, it, it's only a performance hit anyway, because you still get the same response from the API. Um, so it's not it's not a big deal. Even you know, even if you didn't have a timeout and you just aged it out, you'd be fine. Um, the I guess if you wanted to tie return packets into the session, you'd have to, I guess, that, yeah, that's where destination would come in. Because um, I guess you'd be hashing stuff that was coming back from the endpoint. Um, but again, if you didn't rewrite the, the source IP and port, that's fairly straightforward. Yeah, I think um, not on the load balancing thing, but on your question about how do we uh, by having the load balancer in the filters or having the session data and stuff. I don't know if you saw, I had a comment where I talked about um, entity components, not to get into all that, but like, I think that is, that sort of ties into it of like having, being able to have a filter that can uh, update one component and not uh, interfere with uh, computing another component so that we could have uh, like Mark has an issue there where it's like content filtering versus routing. Like yep. with a entity component system, you could have two filters that say, oh, I only get these components and then I get the data. And as long as those two things don't touch, they can run in parallel for free. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I think I think that concept in general of uh, moving towards the entity stuff, because we have I think a lot of where our performance is coming from and like a lot of time is being spent where we create the context object because the context object is pretty heavy. Yeah. And if we move to a entity, uh, but just to be clear, uh, I want to just, I'm not just saying words, like how familiar and comfortable is everyone with entity component systems? And... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I am familiar. I've written one, yes. <laughs> I'm not, but okay. I can. They are, they okay, are well, a different way of yeah. thinking about stuff for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, well, like, if, essentially, if, if you think, if, we have, if you've seen the read context object in Quilkin, for yeah. example, you can think of each of those fields as a component of yeah. the context in general. And what um, uh, ECS entity components does is sort of separates having an instance of something from having the component. So, uh, when you allocate a new context, instead of getting a whole context object back, you would only get uh, an integer that essentially points to that context later. Right. And then you use this um, entity to say, hey, I want um, this component this and this component. Like, OK, I want the, the example I have to say, I want the upstream addresses, and I want the source address. And then you uh, query the thing. And then this provides what you're talking about with data locality, because the you're only uh, querying by the data. You only say, OK, I just want upstream endpoints and the source. And then you know when you get the query back that those will be on the same entity. You can have all those things stored, essentially sequentially, all together. And you don't have to have like, OK, read context object, then another context object, then another one. Uh, so that gives you that. It's like used a lot in games. Like This is a very game-specific uh, thing. But I think it has like, there's a lot of click upload applicability, it's useful in other projects. Uh, but I th don't think a lot of people use it because it's very game specific. Okay. So you're really saying when it comes to filtering that you would effectively, you'd always be declaring for a given filter, which it would always be like, well, this one only uses these parts of the, of the context. Yes, yeah. and this one only read, you, yeah. Yeah, even 
granularity to be like, okay, this only reads these parts and this one needs to write to this part. So you, you can have uh, okay. yeah. multiple components that all read from the same thing, not lock each other, but run yeah. in parallel. While uh, things that need to uh, mutate each other at the same time uh, will essentially run in a parent step while being able to, the rest can run in parallel. Right, right, makes sense. Yeah, it might be that I need to, I need to sort of refork where things are up at at the moment with the, with things like the TTL um, cache and then see, see if I can do the same load balancing thing a whole lot easier with that. Because mm -hmm. um, I had to, yeah, as, as it was, I'd had to make about two or 300 lines of changes to do it. Um, fortunately, due to the foo of Rust, it worked first time. Um, it's miraculous, isn't it? It really is. Yeah. Um, Took me ages to figure it out, but once I did it, the, the damn thing worked first time around. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll give that a go. But it sounds like, yeah, it sounds like you have a better way of doing it than I thought of, so that's all good. Well, yeah, I think it'll take us a while, and we have we want to get low balancing first, so I don't know when we would actually get to having a nice ECS system for Colton, but it would mm -hmm. it'd certainly be nice. Like to have, like the way I would think about it is like, it's actually like the data pi pipeline is the world, and then the messages essentially come in and they get the commands attached and then they uh, you essentially have a bit of a state that's like, okay, now all the filters are run over it. This um, message is clear. We can remove it from the world now. And then we send it back yeah. to the to the destination. And, and then it, do the same thing for it. Go ahead. Does it make sense to have a ticket where we sort of outline to the problem and then, because we seem to have gone through a couple of yeah. different design possibilities. If we could like track that yeah. in a central place with all the different design options mm -hmm. and then, then as we sort of build out more use cases, we'd be like, ah, oh, this one looks better than this one. And yeah, that, that would be, that'd be sweet. I think that'd be really cool. I like that, that would be cool. It's good, it's good as we explore all the different stuff. And we have wonderful people like Giles who are also pushing the limits of what it is we want to do. Well, the fun thing you come to something from outside is suppose you equally figure out what's documented and what isn't, <laughs> and uh, you know. Um, but yeah, so far, I mean, it's it's brilliant to work with. Right, should we move? Uh, actually, a good thing that you're here because I wanted to actually talk about this. Ages ago, Aaron, you put forward, let's make filter an async trait. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I think both of you were like, eh, do we really need to do this? Um, and then Giles did a bunch of work and was like, this would have been really nice to have. And I actually wanted it. So I just wanted to revisit that old PR real quick and say, is this something we want to go back to and turn on or off? And I'm looking for... Or you made that actual code change, Giles, in your filter. You did something kind of hacky, didn't you? Yeah, to, to get around the async thing, I used I Googled around as you do, and I found some hack where basically you you kind of because you know you are fundamentally running under Tokyo, you can still get at the mm -hmm. just up. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. it, you can only have one thread one green thread active when you do that um which is a bit of a pain but i so i ended up forking another os thread um to handle my api oh and this was this was your your custom one this wasn't one that you gave to us gave no no this was the one right just got, it, got, it, got, it, got it. i just wanted to make sure i was clear on that because yeah, I, I yeah the looking. ecmp one was pretty trivial um because it's st inherently stateless um or at least <laughs> it is if you assume the list of endpoints doesn't change um, whereas, whereas this one involves whole whole heap of state. Ah, uh, that's right. I'm looking at that. Okay, because you're doing you're doing this this API lookup thing in the beginning, and you wanted to do it in async. Um, exactly, and that's where I used to say use this sort of hack that that where you like, well, I know that ultimately I am running under Tokyo, even though the function isn't declared async. Yep. How did you do that? What magic was this? Was oh, this just is... spawn? Um, hey, I have to find my code now. I think, I think when I tried to yeah, find ways that you could do it without calling it, I think spawn works. 
that was the that was the stack overflow post that Charles posted. Yeah, that was it. Um, Spawn blocking. Sorry, my stack is about five minutes deep, so I also have to like remember go back and look at what I did. Um, yeah, basically, you grab the handle, you grab the runtime handle, um, and then go into that. Looks like. Like that. I know that's a Tokyo main. Uh... Yeah, I see there, handle current, and then you say handle that enter. Oh, I see, I see, I see. It's like, yeah, it was, um... yeah, it was this. Sorry, the format seems to have messed up. Yeah, it looks like we're looking at exactly the same thing. Uh. <laughs> That's kind of yucky. So we haven't, so this is interesting. We like inside Quilkin, I don't think we've run into anything where we're like, yes, we need it to be async. But it sounds like that's a, that's a use case you have. I don't think we ran into performance issues though. Yeah, I'm just going to look. Mm -hmm. Did you do a comparison on the Yeah, you did a comparison. Attack? It looks pretty much the same. It's like, it's very slightly, uh, more often a bit later, I think. It's not zero cost, but... It's very... Very close. I'm looking at it. I'm trying to discern it out of my eyes. Uh, you can see, like in the 254 one, generally that's like under um, 100 milliseconds, whereas like in the async trait one, it's generally like after 100 milliseconds. So you can see it's like very, very small amounts of like distribution, oh, yeah. like. Hmm. Thoughts, feelings. We could also just let it sit for a while longer and see if more people complain about it. Which is also totally fine. But yeah, in my opinion, no, it should be async just because yeah, it is running under the thing. And if you call block on that, it's worse than calling await because that will actually block, whereas this would just call an await uh, and let the executor decide uh, how to handle that await. How to handle it. Finny, what do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I'll much, I'll, I'll more prefer like if we wait for like other use cases, I mean, I get that we have this, like in this case, we have like a workaround at least, which would be somewhat similar to what we would run into anyways, even though it's a bit like hacky. Um, yeah, because I feel like if we should add, if we should add the, um, if we should make this async now and we get like a perf hit, then it affects pretty much every packet that runs or croaking regardless of whether they use async or, or not. Um, so it'll be it'll be nice if it's worth it if we have like uh, a few use cases at least. I feel is there any actually you might know this better you would know this better I would so do if any is there any way we could do it so that like a filter can declare whether it's async or not? Uh, or is that that's just that? Yeah, <laughs> you're like, no. oh god, that doesn't sound good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that doesn't sound like okay. no, you kind of need two traits. Like, you, yeah, you, what you'd have is like two traits like one, an async version, yeah. and an async version, and like and that's just doing gross. some weird stuff, like, uh, based like on... some kind of weird enum. Yeah, okay, yeah, fine. okay, yeah. bad idea. Never mind. Yeah, I thought no. I'd ask the question. Um, well, like, the way to do it is to uh, have. To not, well, without using async crate, oh, actually, I don't think that works. I think you have to box it. If you could not use, you have to box it no matter what. It's the main yep. tag. Yep, yep, yep. Um, right. Well, hmm. I mean, like, again, if 
we're talking about performance. I think this is like another thing where the ECS would probably offset this because like, again, we would not be boxing as much. We would be bo like, if you, um, in the code sample I shared, like you don't actually, mm. if we did the ECS, you wouldn't be returning a response every time. You would essentially be mutating an object. Uh, so there would be less, um, if the future would not be as big, essentially it would be a future that returns a unit or result. So yeah, that's a, we don't have that at the moment. Yeah, let's write up. I'd love to see that write up that ticket, and then we can do the the comparison of different different designs there. I think it'd be quite interesting, um, and what that would look like as well. And if we find one we like, we can also make a plan about how we want it refactored to get there, possibly over time as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we will leave it at that. Um, that seems reasonable. Oh, this is going to be a fun one. 380, which is the next one, um, which was as excuse to drop when full. Um, Oh, this is an interesting discussion. I'd I'd love to see this be like a like what should what should happen when like a proxy gets overloaded rather than sort of define the solution mm -hmm. up front. Like let's explore kind of the problem space and see what sort of falls out from it that way. Um, because I think it's a it's a good discussion to have, mm -hmm. and there's a bunch of ways where things could go horribly wrong. Well, to start off, since since I opened the issue, uh, I I think the proxy should try to behave as normally as possible under load. Like it's like essentially the proxy's job to take the load and essentially sh shoulder the load and pretend that the load is basically non-existent to the de destination and always ensure that's you know even if there, we don't have a rate limit, there is it is not being overwhelmed. It is not actually getting dust. and like uh, it should. It should endeavor to stay up it, during that time. It should not uh, immediately try to crash out and then restart itself to start a new one. I think it should try to stay up as long as possible. Think up time. That. Yeah. Um. I guess the other interesting question, I guess, is um, oh. it comes like. Noisy dog. Yeah. Chew. Chew your feud. Um it's what was I gonna say? So okay, so say we're we're talking about a DDoS type situation or it's also kind of fun, I suppose same same if you if you end up connecting too many clients to a particular proxy, which like is essentially the same thing anyway. Um in the current state as it is right now packets are going to get dropped essentially or they're not i'm trying to work out what what actually does it do right uh, now right now uh we will uh get to a certain uh amount we have a limit uh in a queue yep. oh there's multiple queues uh there is the os uh network queue the actual buffer whatever whatever yep. happens there and then like on the Quilkin user space side, uh, we read in every packet as soon as possible, and then we put them into a message queue. And if we hit we hit that limit, uh, I believe it just blocks. Yeah, I, I think the queue is like really really small. I think it's just like one one packet each, like you can buffer. So it's like it, if if you try to spam with lots of packet, pretty much all of it will be handled by the OS before we have a chance to read it. So most of the dropping will happen on the OS level. So we're kind of... Are you sure? I thought, it was, I thought there was a larger buffer. Let's see what you can um, might be. I, I remember wanting to have like a zero buffer, but it wasn't possible. <laughs> and I picked like one, because that was what Tokyo allowed me to set as a channel size. I would... <laughs> Now I've got to find uh, where it is that the data comes here. Proxy. Let's 
look that one. I think it's this one. Let's see who can find the oh, actual code yes. first. Okay, I got, I got it. Uh, line 107 source proxy server .rs. Uh, it's a 1024 buffer. There, there, there are some, uh, the sessions, uh, I think, on the other side are a single packet size in, in session manager, at least one. Oh, packet. The packet channel is the um, it's the one that comes back. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 an internal. It's not a okay. receiving. Yeah, I think you. Where are we? You sure that's internal? I think that well, might be the From memory, that is where I think data comes in from. Ooh, hey dog. Like data comes in from in the uh, in function receive from receive from, uh, but that passes it down to the send packets. Uh, like that's a loop that then distributes those key, those messages over a bunch of workers that then have their own. That sounds about right. One thousand twenty-four queue. So that each worker has like one thousand and twenty-four uh, messages that they can help. I think that's at least my understanding. Yeah. So on on the receiving side, I sent the link. Um, it's we the, the size of the channel is pretty much the number of threads we have. So yeah, I remember this. So basically, we have the one task that reads packet of the socket, and it basically just round robin through all um, all the um, yeah all the workers whenever it gets a packet from the socket. So the channel is that big. And then, yeah, I think the other one is probably in the other direction where we do something different. There we, we also have the same one task that reads off the queue, and that queue happens in this case is 1024, it looks like. Oh, yeah, I kind of forgot what was the point there, but now we know the number. Uh, like, like, I think no matter what it is, like, it will get overwhelmed, like, just because this is the thing you put in front of video games, and people did us of video games for like no reason, so it will just always happen. So we just yeah. need to, or we need to have a strategy for DDoS, whatever that may be. Yes, yeah, so I, I think like on the application level, there isn't like much we can do if you have enough traffic. Like the OLS will, will pretty much break down before we do, or whoever handles the packet before that. But I, on Quook and on the Quook side, if you spam, if you try to spam it um, with uh, as much packets as it can handle, or more than it can handle, it will. Yeah, the current behavior would be that it will drop those packets and it will work as normal. Um, so I guess if it's sorry, go. On. No, I was going to say we should test it and see what happens, but yes. Yeah, because I, I usually use the, you know, the, um, I sent a link a few months ago, the, the C library that I used to spam with a lot of uh, things. Yeah, that pretty much, um, yeah, that's a good, it sends as many packets as it can. And you, you can actually see that the OS drops a lot of packets and Quicken doesn't handle 
everything that it, we threw to it. Because we had the issue sometime in December before we started working, doing a lot of perf work, where you would spam cooking with a lot of packets and it would just run out of memory, basically. And, but yeah, it doesn't do that today. That's I remember you doing that. Yeah, we can actually do that with the the iperf three type stuff that exists. We can just push that push that up as far as you want to push it. Um, what was I gonna say? I had a th another thought. That the that was actually the this conversation was also where you know we were talking about um, having a global rate limiter as well. Yeah, because you were, we were talking if anyone we were talking about like you change things so we have like a per I, per IP connection uh, rate limit. But I was like, well, if if I'm the application developer, I'm the games developer, and I'm like, I'm gonna have, I don't know, pick a number, ten people that connect. I know, I know, ten people are gonna connect. I know that's what that's what I expect anyway. Ten people to connect, um, and I know each one is gonna send like thirty frames, like thirty frames a second. If I'm gonna get hit by a DDoS, and it's gonna, suddenly I'm gonna get more people connecting to this than I would, having a global load balancer means that it'll actually mean that there's only a certain amount of throughput at any given point in time. But I guess the question, like, and that would that would potentially stop Quilkin from maybe like falling over entirely because you'd have a global load balancer. But it would mean that even if players were connected, like the thing would be unresponsive anyway because it would, the packets their their own packets wouldn't get through. So, uh, that was that was the impetus for that that idea of a global. Well, I think load balancer I thought they do uh, defer to sort of the implementation because if you have like if you're for example running multiple quilkins and the player can connect to multiple versions and if they yeah. can't connect to one they'll just try the next one you know but that was that was my thought there so sounds like we should at least have like a test or something like oh a way to ensure that this has a good behavior. Uh, action item from community. Let's test this. Uh, test. Record. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I like it. All righty. Uh, anything else on this topic? Kind of related. Uh, I just wanted to bring up to you, Amar, because you said you were working on that firewall thing. Oh, it's yeah. Kind of related to like having global rate limiters and doing networking and stuff. I don't know if you've ever looked at um, container network interface. Um, it is a abstract um, Network interface for container. Essentially, what we were talking about, like, oh, how do we have these settings for, like, uh, we want the container to just block, just drop all these connections from these IPs and stuff. And it's like, these are okay, abstract rules for having a container do that stuff. It doesn't, it doesn't do like dynamic updates at the moment. But I believe for doing like static configuration, like I know, um, Linkerd uh, uses has a CNI plugin for if you want like to that. have it do IP table rules automatically. Uh, and have that uh, distributed yeah. across all the containers, uh, it would do that for you. And so, so just me, yeah, I'm bringing that up to like check that out. Oh, okay. so like if you're running, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I've seen this in in the context of like um, what whatever your Kubernetes mm -hmm, plugin yeah. is and and stuff too. Yeah, and you can have cool, like the plug the CMI. I don't understand all of it because it's plugin a lot for a lot of stuff, but essentially. You can have that pl like a Quilkin plugin also plug in with like the firewall plugin mm -hmm. and have all of them work together. And so we can save a lot of time implementing that functionality if we can work with like CNI. I'll make a I'll make a separate issue on that on the repository. Yeah. Track that. Yeah. I figure yeah. it makes sense to just start with like just user space type stuff, and then yeah, yeah. we can we can plug into other stuff. That is kind of oh, I see it, and it rewrites pods IP tables. Yeah, this would have to be like it would uh, it would literally be like a separate executable that you have to run, like you install it separately. From my understanding. Interesting. That is cool, though. Yeah, because that's the same. I guess LinkedIn is using it, but uh, I know um, on Istio and on yeah, Istio, I would also have the So the idea would be anything that comes to the pod gets handled by the proxy. So they basically just rewrite 
IP table rules so that yeah, all requests go through the proxy mm -hmm. without yeah. the actual service knowing. Uh, interesting. Okay. So rather than running it as a sidecar, you you update CNI CRI and then and then it. Um... I think you run it in in your sidecar. Um, I'm, just reading. Uh, I'm not. Right. Yeah, right. I'm not a Kubernetes that. expert, so like. Yeah, it is there. At least they have like an init uh, container, so that runs first and sets up all the IP tables thing, mm -hmm. and then afterwards the um, proxy actually runs. Yeah, I guess the CNI part is a bit more um, large scale. Like maybe that that fits more into how pods talk to each other rather than yeah. like a single pod. So it might be yes, a um, use relevant for us, but maybe the IP tables mm -hmm, configuring yeah. part would be. Yeah, under. we're only interested in the networking part. Or, and like, yeah. be, essentially being a part in someone else's larger plugin of like, I have a rules, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's, uh, yeah, please, yeah, please follow. That's a, that's an interesting one. We should look into that. I like that idea. Yeah, and there's stuff you can do, isn't there, with chaining uh, CNIs and stuff like that. So you can sort of slide, it, slide an extra mm -hmm. letter in or whatever. But yeah, yeah the, uh, it's complicated, though, because there's like two different types of plugins. There is like the chainable plugin, and then there's a non-chainable plugin. It's mm -hmm. a whole big thing. Yeah, I play with it a bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, yeah, so, so say like the Istio thing, yeah, they just their init container sets up IP tables rules, but then if you wanted to, I guess it's a bit, bit different for DDoS, presumably, because you're trying to set them up on the fly. Yeah, it, I think they specifically say they don't do dynamic configuration at the moment, but they're, yeah. they say they're interested, and if like, people are interested to reach out to them, so. Oh, okay. Like, we're yeah, interested, and they're cool. like, great, you do the work. And we're like, uh, <laughs> cool. The other thing I wondered about the DDoS stuff is, is there any sort of mileage in, um, Stuff where you can kind of say, well, if we if we don't intercept existing, so I guess the, the challenge is knowing what's a valid session. Um, but if, but you know, if you kind of have valid sessions, and you can say, well, let let's let those flow through as normal, and then kind of rate them at arrival of new ones. Yeah, I mean, to some extent, the caching thing would well, do that. But uh, the problem would be that the, the problem is the the main queue though, because like the main queue of yeah, just UDP yeah. at that moment uh, yeah. in the first like the very first check before we can. Like that's where the all the blocks just like that. Packet, yeah. yeah, there's a, yeah. a yeah. bottleneck at that point. Yeah. So yeah. to some extent, you can kind of be able to cheat like you do on home routers, where you, you cheat and you move the bottleneck deliberately. Mm -hmm. But I guess that doesn't help if the volumes are extreme, because yeah, it's not. You'd still drop good stuff. Yeah, this yeah. is where also I, I'm thinking about where. Um, maybe we should sooner rather than later start thinking about sort of like rules and actions and stuff like if if, uh, if we can it's identify, overwhelmed then do this yeah if it's overwhelmed do this or let people like i can see that you're coming up against rate limiting here because it seems like a ddos so like tell the firewall to block these ip addresses at a higher level than than cooking and start being reactive that way um mm -hmm. well we should yeah, sit down and, and do some design work on that um, cause I feel like the, the way I'm thinking about cooking, at least personally is like, is this is one part of like seven different things that will be part of an abuse system. Um, mm -hmm. and so being able to co collate that data of like, okay, like who is this coming from? Do they look like a real player? Um, is it someone we trust it, like, oh, no, it's not. Therefore, like, let's just cut them off entirely versus, I don't know, other things or we've just identified that they're trying to do some sort of griefing type thing. And then in which case we'll just yeah. throw them with all the other griefing players and they can just be match made separately or versus cutting them off entirely. Yeah, kind of I think, yeah, yeah. Not even that, we'll say cooking is just like, hey, is this person sending too much? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then you say chill, yeah. Um, there's, yeah, this, we have access to all kinds of interesting stuff. Yeah, with the data that we have here that I think will be very useful for a lot of other people. Cool. How are we doing on time? We got 15 minutes. No, that's a good. That CNI stuff sounds really cool. Um, the other question I had was, um, should we clean up some of our pull requests or turn them into issues? Uh, we have some stuff back from May. Like, uh, Aaron, you haven't you haven't touched your wasm filter thing in months. Should we just close that mm -hmm. for a while? Yeah, we can we can close on if you want. Yeah, just just. Looking at some old stuff here. Mm -hmm. 
Um, if we want to turn that data pipeline stuff into like a ticket to talk about through either data pipeline or ECS and other stuff, that might be kind of yeah. cool. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I've been on holidays for the past month, so like okay. many of the players have not been updated. That's why. So, like, but yeah, oh, you can close some of that. Like that wasn't time stuff. I wasn't even going to touch it in the last month. So yeah, just thought I'd throw that out there. It came up at the last time we were what we were looking at, but yeah, you can. I guess we can close that. I believe um, more of the discussion has happened on the issue rather than the pull request anyway. Yeah, that's good. Uh, actually, for for me, I think uh, it looks like the uh, clear bot history on new build seems to be working for everyone except Dufinier, who has blocked the bot, which is kind of hilarious. Um, <laughs> it's apparently apparently it's annoying, uh, but it seems to be working. So if we're happy with that, actually, I might just merge it now. I might just approve it now. I'll update the branch. Um, if there are uh, what was i going to say if there are better things we could do there that's fine too i know there's there's just pain in that like running code in cloud build is just easier for us for a security point of view cuz just google being google um and so it it doesn't it doesn't work quite as nicely as as something like github actions um but the notifications is just nice cuz it can tell people um how to find things if they're wrong. But we could also set it up so that it only pings when something breaks, which is also fine. I like the notifications personally, just because it means I can like hit a button and then run off. And then when I go and check my email, I know whether the thing's actually finished or not without having to remember to go check and check. But that's just me and my workflow. So if there's- I don't some... get any GitHub emails, so- yeah. <laughs> You're like, you just filter them all out. Yeah. <laughs> you no. opt in whenever you want. No, it's <laughs> like the specific option where it's like, do you want us to send any email? And it's like, no. Right. My my email is my to do list, so I get all the emails, and then I'm like, okay, now I know what I have to look at. I don't look at GitHub notifications at all. Uh, I exclude, that's it. What I use GitHub notifications. Yeah. Right? I only go to there when I'm going to work. You know. Got it. Of course, all my all my GitHub emails also go to my work email, so I just turn that off when I'm not working. But um, yeah, I was gonna say if there's if the, if there are ways we can make it better, um, I'm happy to hack at that. Apparently, yes. I'm, I'm trying to come out of doing CI stuff and doing more Quilkin stuff, but I'm also happy to keep working on build tools and making the dev experience better where possible. Um, oh, that was the other fun one I wanted to talk about. Uh, this this sort of lay fallow for a little while as well. Um, the replacing SLUG with tracing that seemed to get stuck on some performance stuff. Uh, and it's an interesting problem. Um, I should actually write a note. The other thought I had here um, was to maybe go straight to open telemetry, leave logging where it is, but go to open telemetry for the distributed tracing side of things, which is the stuff that I'm probably more interested in. I don't know if it doesn't necessarily help us as much. Um, may not help us as much with the uh the just like cpu performance or like like lo local testing as much uh although it may anyway i just wonder where people thought about where that was at before i randomly talk about stuff this is sure this tab um, i find it can probably give a better yeah. knowledge of the state but um i Looks think like my understanding was that the the performance issues is just because uh Currently, it's called, like the instrumentation is called on everything, which is just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember it, it's sort of like if, if we only wanted to use this for like logging, then we could since, yeah, I mean, we usually don't log a lot on the hot, on the critical path anyways. Uh, it was mostly having the, yeah, as I mentioned, having the instrumentation on like each filter read uh, or write function that yeah that became a bit expensive yeah i think i think we should just um have that config you know like so that uh either like you said it specifically like hey i want to run Quilkin with instrumentation uh, we do we do have a debug build and a release build already right now so we could yeah, actually have a, a debug build we could do it based on that even well uh i think you want usually you want to do instrumentation for like performance of on release builds but with debug info or at least that's how i've done it I'm not sure how other people mm. have done. 
the, stuff. the stuff that's in my head with this is also like um is basically distributed tracing as well like being able to across all the proxies visualize like down to the player level some information like how long each maybe how long each one took or um to process in, entirely or what what weird stuff may have happened um which is why I like the trace library and plugging that into open tracing i think is really exciting because then we can start doing some some cool visualizations and see what what players are doing what with their with their bandwidth um okay what do we do we want to write some yeah so you just say yeah that uh Instrumentation should not be on by default. It, has, it should be behind a config, either behind like a default or sorry, a debug uh, or a feature flag. Default. Debug. Or. The main reason I'm hesitant about the debug is just because Rust does not actually have a good debug flag, like the config debug assertions. Yeah, right. is no, it does not behave how you would expect. Uh, like it includes, it's yeah, run, it's run on release, not run on like when debug info is there and stuff necessarily. Uh, feature flag. Um, I will have this for myself. Lost it. There it is. So that, that's a good comment. Yeah, because we we track metrics, and I actually still want to go back and do this. We track metrics about like like on performance and stuff. But if you want to dig into like, um, oh, you can get metrics on individual ones. But if you want to get like per request metrics, distributed tracing would make that really really cool and really really handy for for, for generating yeah. ability. Yeah, the Prometheus has a problem with cardinality, doesn't it? Yeah. With the yeah. But we, if you do something like um, if you do op like open tracing and you go to a distributed tracing platform like uh, like something open source like Jaeger or like we put stuff in Stackdriver and like there's other things that do it, um, and Open Telemetry is a, a front end for that, then you can start to get down to the, like the per request level. So cool well, stuff that way. I don't know if you've already thought about this, but like how would we how would we move from Prometheus to Open Telemetry? So they'd work separately. So you'd still have your mm -hmm. metrics, and that's fine. Open. Um, so we'd keep. I think eventually. So um, open telemetry is meant to cover metrics and tracing and logging. Eventually, <laughs> for Rust, though, all it really does is tracing with its library. Um, so eventually, it will. It should cover all three, and that's the goals of the project. But like all open source projects, it doesn't do everything yet. Um, the metrics library is still alpha from the last time I looked at it. Um, and I think the last time you looked at it, FNA was missing a whole bunch of functionality, if I remember, remember correctly, yeah. Um, and the tracing library that you have has a plugin for open telemetry, which is really cool. So you can like trace it through. Um, so I would say leave leave stuff, leave metrics in Prometheus for now. I don't think we would change any of that. That's fine. Um, but if we want to do, yeah, for tracing, like we can use this tracing library, use the open tracing uh, plugin, and that 
I think there's probably like three or four steps that are hidden in there behind like a profit thing. And then uh, we can we can hopefully then plug that into one of the systems that allow us to do distributed tracing. So cool. Uh, that also reminded me, I don't know if you saw, but um, the uh, Pion developers actually got a working uh, example of um, WebRTC working of all that stuff. So like uh, we might now actually be able to check out some of their uh, libraries and maybe use some of that. Um, I think I saw example. Let me see if I can find where's the DTLS issue. They updated that. I saw that they did the the DTLS examples. Of course, it probably needs a security review. Um, oh, it's gotten even more fancy. Certificate style hub. Listen, zero point one now instead of zero point zero eleven. Yeah, they've got they've updated a lot of this stuff. Nice. Yeah, we can have a think about that too. That's also super cool. We have two minutes left. Uh, okay, well, this is a big question now to ask. Like, do, do you want to run Quilkin under WebRTC? No. That just runs under UEP, so it wouldn't, you wouldn't need anything about that, wouldn't you? You wouldn't need to run Quilkin somehow above it. I don't think so. I don't know. My only thought with the pawn stuff was more around just being able to rip out their DTLS implementation. Mm -hmm, yeah. That was my thought. Well, also, well, like SIP stuff, I think, is useful. Like, again, session, like, that's the stuff we're doing here. Like, you know, having a session and initiating, like, same stuff like telecoms we're doing. Uh, might as well, you know, use those standards. The I think the interesting question with that is probably around. Um, Yes, I think we can, but I think there's so many UDP standards for games that, like, well, standards, quote unquote, oh, yeah, is a very yeah, loose term. Yeah, yeah. Is the is the tricky problem? But if we can't, I mean, yeah, if there's stuff we can pull out and be like, this is this is the anointed way according to Quilkin. If you want to use I, it, you can. That would be yeah. pretty sweet. In my mind, these these are the things that would be filters, for example. You know, yeah. things that are like you can't rely on having in every stack. Whereas, like, you know, I think load balancing is something. They might want in every instance. No, it's, there's, yeah. I, one of the things that I've always had in my head as a goal of Quilkin is like being able to be like, okay, this is, an, we're going to make this easy for you. And because we make it easy for you, people will adopt these things as standards or more people will adopt these things as standards. Yeah, it, it should be out, out of the box, like yeah. an out of the box experience. Yeah, that'd be sweet. I like that a lot. Okay, I need to run to another meeting, unfortunately. But as always, it is a pleasure to talk with you all. Fine. See Thanks. you all next time. Good stuff in there. Um, sweet. Oh, well before we go, um, just to remember, uh, I'm taking December off. So I'm just giving you a heads mm -hmm. up. I don't know if anything's going to happen in December, but I will be, I will be away as yeah, well. Yeah, like it's two or three meetings ahead of that. <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> That's true. But I like to give people a heads up. Okay. Excellent. All right. I'll catch you all later. Bye, all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Hold on.